Welcome back to the Manage to Win podcast. You know, sometimes you just have a conversation with someone and, and it just flows. I'm fortunate we have a lot of good guests, so that happens often here. Today, I'm going to talk with Tom Hardison of the Generative Leadership Group. He teaches generative leadership, so that's something to learn. Before that, I want to just mention our sponsor, Habitly.com. A lot of what shifted Tom into becoming a great leader was changing his habits. He realized what I'm doing is not working. I'm playing to my strengths too much. And so it's hurting me, not helping me. And Habitly is all about learning those soft skills, those relational skills, those time management skills, how to achieve goals, how to be a great leader, those different things that help you be the best you can be. I think you're really going to enjoy this podcast. Tom is a soft-spoken, but courageous leader and leadership coach, and he really lays out some important tips on how to be your best as a leader. Let's dive in. Tom, welcome to the show. I'm really glad to have you on. And you talk about a term I've never used before. So generative leadership. I was so worried I would say it wrong. So um, can you explain to the audience what that is and, and how you've kind of developed this approach? Yeah. Well, first, David, thank you for inviting me to, to have this conversation with you. And generative leadership is about how do we produce and create leadership within ourselves, with the teams we're working with, and extend that in a coherent, collective way throughout an organization so that we're aligned on a common purpose and we're able to adapt and create with new conditions that come at us in this complex, ever-changing world we live in. So, Yeah, no, I, it, it sounds good at a 10,000-foot view, but can you kind of drill that down into, uh, because uh, so generative, why did you choose that word? I mean, it's it, it's kind of like generating things constantly or whatever, but why that yeah. word? Well, so for me, it started with, I got stuck in my leadership um, from a number of perspectives. One, things were changing at the company I was working in. Second, my youngest son was really struggling in high school and dropped out of high school. And my wife and I were trying to figure out what do we do? And I needed to make a change. And I realized I didn't know the leadership skills I needed to have to be able to deal with all that complexity. So first was just kind of realizing I'm stuck and I need to learn something different. What I've been doing for 28 years worked well, and it isn't working anymore. So the first part was just recognizing I'm stuck. The second part is beginning to say, well, what do I need to be able to generate a different kind of leadership? And uh, I went on a path to find that out uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And really what I began to discover is it begins with a few set of steps. Um, first step. Well, well, can we, before we sure. go there, so it, it's really kind of interesting. So my understanding correctly, you were 28 years in at HP. Yes. And then you realized I'm stuck because of business roadblocks, whatever. And then also you had this personal situation going on with someone you love dearly. Um, and then it, at that point, is that when you left HP? I stayed with HP another year. But I began okay. to sort through what was I struggling with? What were the challenges I was experiencing? And what did I need to learn to be able to move from there? It's it's really interesting because, Tom, you may not know this, but I had a dot-com in uh, the year 2000 that got funded. Craig White in HP was funding oh. dot-coms at the urging of Carly. And um, a year later, the funding got yanked. And uh, we were told we didn't meet the criteria, but it was that the fund was being shut down. And I foolishly stayed on because someone walked through the door and said, oh, I can solve all your problems. And a year and a half later, I shut down the company and um, 
it was it was a dot com to a dot bomb, and it was a terrible mm-hmm. thing. Wiped me out emotionally, financially. But it's interesting that both of us were involved with HP, you in a much more deep level. And both of us, that led us to a point where we realized, hey, we're stuck because after that thing crashed and burned a few months later, and, and I actually, I think I put this in my LinkedIn bio, I was face down on the floor in a hotel room in, in Texas on a sales trip mm-hmm. and a new job, crying out to God. And I was just like, what am I doing? I'm 40, whatever. And I'm, I've hit it. I'm, I'm wiped out. I'm restarting. And it was the first time I ever got a prompting where I got this message of help people avoid your mistakes. It wasn't, you're so smart, but help people avoid your mistakes because you've made a lot of them. And um, that led me on the path to realize I had leadership attributes, but no skills. Now I'm sure you had skills, a lot more skills than me, but, but, you know, uh, I think this is such a tough thing for leaders, particularly people who are driven to realize they need to make these changes before they hit that wall or go off that cliff or have that project or that company crash. Is there any more detail you want to give of work you've done with other people or yourself? Maybe some of us who you had a wall, but at least you were still going. Things were smooth, you know, with your company. Well, things were crazy at HP. They've gone up and down. But um, do you have any other thoughts you have of, of helping leaders realize when they're stuck, but they may not realize it right now? Yeah. Well, I'll share what signs showed up for me. And uh, some of some of what I hear as I work with leaders and their teams now. So the first was I tried doing it harder, doing what I know harder. And that just kept grinding me. And uh, I started to get messages that I'm using my strengths too much. I'm overusing them and they're actually getting in my way and holding me back and hurting the people around me. Um, can you give me an example? Of, I, I really like what you're saying, and I, I don't want to be too personal, so you can cut it anywhere you want. But can you can you give somebody a, an example of what that might be? Because we, we normally think we play to our strengths, we'll be fine. Yeah. So uh, an example from a, a work perspective, and, a, and then I'll share a personal one too. From a work perspective, I was working with a team trying to put launch a new product that our Um, Vice President had promised we would deliver into the market, had announced it was coming. And I was working with the team, and it was multinational. And uh, one of the individuals was pulling together the forecast for what we were going to be able to do. And the team in the in the country, China, um, was saying, no, that's not what we're going to be able to do. What we're hearing from the market is something very different. And the product manager in the U.S. felt the need to, to put together a forecast that would meet the expectations for the business. So here was this dissonance. And I came down harshly on the product manager saying, we're not listening to what the team in the market is telling us. And that's a problem. We need to be able to listen to the team. But I did it in a way that that was the worst conversation that individual had ever had with a manager in their life. So I was burning the relationship with that individual. I recognized that didn't go well. And I followed up um, to try to to address it. But I'd reached that point where I was burning relationships. Ouch. Yeah. Same thing happened. I didn't understand what was going on with my son, 16 at the time, struggling with what turns out to be a a different place on the neurodiversity perspective of, of people in the world. And I wasn't understanding him and listening to him, I wasn't understanding my wife and listening to her. She was furious, he was furious, and I didn't know what I was doing and what I needed to do differently. It's, Not it's interesting. what I wanted to be. What, I, what I'm hearing, and I relate to this, is, uh, it's, you know, you were just trying to solve a problem, right? 
you're a problem solver. I okay. trained as an engineer focused on solving problems using more of my analytical network than my emotive empathy network in my brain yeah. and uh, not understanding that I was also caught in this system. So I was reacting in this system to what was going on, and I wasn't able to separate myself from what was happening in the system and be able to take different perspectives and be able to think about, okay, I could react, which is normal, happens to all of us. That's part of being a human being. Yeah. And I could shift from an unconscious reactive state into a more creative state focused on what are the outcomes that we'd really like to achieve here? What would really make a difference for us if we yeah. could pursue the outcomes and engage people in a creative conversation rather than expressing my reactivity, my frustration, and burning relationships? Well, it, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, as an engineer, you're highly skilled at asking questions and being analytical. But it sounds like in, in these two instances, you were under intense time pressure, either self-imposed or by others. And so it sounds, correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like you were making, trying to make a decision based on the data you had at hand and the life experience you had had to date. And that kind of closed your mind to a core skill you naturally had, which was ask questions, get more data. Yeah, I did it. But to a fault, I can overuse the get more data. It wasn't <laughs> more data wasn't what was needed. Yeah. Understanding the people around me, understanding what outcomes we wanted to create together, and then pursuing that in a way that made it safe for us to be truthful, um, for us to trust each other's listening to perspectives. Yeah. And recognizing that this wasn't necessarily a problem I could fix. This was a system I could help influence. We yeah. could pursue the outcomes and recognize when outcomes weren't possible. So it, if I were to fast forward, it, it took 10 years for us to get to a, a good understanding of what was going on for our son. And yeah. now we're in a far better place. But that was a pretty challenging 10 years. Oh, yeah, that's that's a tough road. Yeah. That's a tough road. And um, it sounds like for whatever reason, and and I'm biased because I'm I'm applying the hard lessons I've had to learn and I'm still learning that, you know, you as a problem solver, a lot of times we can get in a mode of we're going to go from problem to solution instead of we're going to have a problem and these people say these things and maybe we take a baby step in one direction and we see whether that works and then we take the next step so we focus on just a small step instead of man this is a big problem i got to get this thing fixed and i'm going to go all the way to the end you know i'm going to jump to the end and try to make that happen it, what, am i am i hearing you correctly that maybe part of that was was going on yes and one of it it was. I was thinking, well, here's what I see as a potential solution and focused more on the task than the relationship. Yeah. Uh, the, the second piece that I'd offer is one of the models that I've learned more about and, and apply more now is an idea of complexity theory from Dave Snowden. And uh, in his framework, there, there are some things that are simple, they're clear. And all of us looking at it would pretty much agree on what to do. There are some things that are complicated, and they take analysis. And depending upon the perspectives and, and background and experience, analysis can lead to some different possibilities. And through further exploration, we can get to a, a good enough answer that will move us forward. Complex situations are emergent. They're going to unfold through the interdependent actions of a complex system, both the people involved and the environment around us. 
And what we can do is small experiments that if they don't work out, that's okay. And we learn something. And yeah. from that learning, we can then identify, well, what are the things we learned that are working? Let's try a little more of those. And what's not working? And let's let go of things or find other ways. So it's dealing with the emergent nature of complex life that stretches our skill set from the way I was certainly taught uh, initially growing up. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. This is so valuable to the audience, um, and and I really think so. And the, the other thing that strikes me, which you, I, I think you're possibly alluding to, sometimes it's a it's a complex situation because there's things you need to learn more about the situation or what you're trying to do. Sometimes it's complex because people who are involved at the moment there hasn't been enough information gleaned from them, shared by them, either because they don't feel safe or they may not even realize it yet when you're dealing with personal things. You know, they may not even know the information yet. Or when it comes to concrete information like data, you know, market data or whether the product works when it does this or whatever, that may not exist yet. So mm -hmm. so there's, exist there's missing information that creates complexity Whereas if you have all the information, it might be a simple decision for everybody. Am I hearing you correctly? Yeah. Well, there, I think there are a couple of pieces, even in kind of an, an ordered world, which is where complicated and the clear kind of fit, where life is ordered, yeah, um, yeah. we're missing information. And we need to make decisions without all the information at times. And we can create some scenarios of What's the range of possibility here? And, and then choose a path and be ready to course correct. In the complex domain, it, it, it's a little bit like the, the particle physics. The observing something actually changes it. So just by observing, and, and this is where I come back to generative leadership, if I begin to become a better observer of myself, and I begin to notice, here's a situation where I am reacting, and there's an underlying fear, anger, frustration going on that's causing me to react because I need to make sure something gets solved right away. The more I can observe myself and accept, oh, I'm reacting. Okay, that's a way I could respond. And that's not the only way I have to respond. I have an opportunity to step back and consider the possibilities and the choices and to involve the people I care most about in that situation, in that conversation, because they may have insight that I don't know. Yeah. And uh, I've only learned this in the last year or two, Tom, but that there's two major emotions. At least there's a line of thought that goes this direction, love and fear. And I love what you're saying about the, the, uh, I'm reacting because a, a reaction is a, is a fear. It, it's triggered from a fear. Anger is triggered from a fear. And it's so hard to stop and do that observe piece that you're saying, you know, when you, when that cortisol is pumping into your brain and you're in fight or flight mode and it's just blocking all problem solving and I'm going to win and you know, I love what you're saying about becoming more aware of yourself with this generative leadership model that you've got, because it, it, you've alluded to it once again. But I think what you're saying is, you know, before we can help other people change and improve, we have to really work on ourselves because they're going to follow our actions, our words more than, you know, what we're telling them to do if we're then if we're doing something different. So. Yeah, I, I echo and build on what you're saying here is it's hard for me to give what I do not yet give to myself and know how to do myself. I can, I can have a conceptual awareness of it, yeah. but I don't have that embodied capacity to practice it myself and to recognize when I'm not practicing it, which happens often every day. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I'm there. You know, one of the other things that you've spoken about, um, but not in, in this, uh, I'm going to narrow it down, put it through the funnel, is that another thing I had to learn was that a lot of times in the past, I wanted to win the conversation. I wanted to convince the other people. And even if it cost me part of the relationship, the relationship I thought would just be there. I just made an assumption it's going to be there. And I realized as I look back on some of my bigger mistakes that if I had just put the relationship first and asked more questions and not been driving so fast that the solution I thought was best, I would have not only saved or improved the relationship, maybe the relationship stayed, but I would have improved it, but I also wouldn't have made the mistake or at least as bad as I made it, because I was just driving because at the time I was convinced it was right. So it sounds like you've also gone through this process of um, that engineering side, which is data-driven, have have now been balanced by something where you're more engaged on the relational side. Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, a, a number of different experiences, both learning uh, and developing myself as a coach, uh, I'll just share one model that I that I share with people. It comes from Bob Anderson and the Leadership Circle, and uh, one half of the circle talks about our re- reactive patterns, tendencies that every human being develops growing up. We learn how to react to be safe with the people that are raising us, our caregivers, our teachers. Um, I certainly learned that. And I learned uh, how to drive to get results. I learned how to back away and create distance and and be critical. And I learned how to try to please. And, and so different patterns I developed that when I overuse them, hold me back from actually focusing on creating better outcomes in collaboration with other people. So I now that I'm aware of some of those overused strengths and, and how they hold me back, I'm in a better position to be able to say, okay, where am I now? So this, uh, uh, this speaks to one of my favorite quotes from Peter Drucker, which is the first and foremost job of a leader is to take charge of our own energy and then to help orchestrate the energy of those around us. So for me to take charge of my own energy, I need to be a better observer of, well, what am I in a reactive state? Am I, am I fearful or afraid or frustrated? And that's, a, that's important to acknowledge. That's a message that there's something I care about here. So if I can switch from the anger, the frustration to say, thank you, what do I care about? What is it I most want to have as an outcome? Then I can switch, and that's a conscious choice to switch. And it takes practice. I've got a lifetime still to practice, however long I have. And I get knocked off balance all the time. And it's a matter of coming back and saying, oh, okay, What do I care about now? What's most important now? So, Tom, let me shift gears. And because you're a super nice guy and you're also super smart. So this is great. But so you have you work with leaders and you're also a leader. Mm -hmm. And um, you've learned all this relational side and that type of thing. And you used to drive a little bit too fast. Maybe I don't know how you drive your car, but drive companies or people or yourself. So now as a leader and as someone who coaches leaders, how do you enforce boundaries with a client or someone who's on your team who's, who's outside of your standards or not pursuing the target that you guys had agreed that they were going to pursue? How, how do you hold them accountable and, and keep them within the, the lanes? The first is to go back to have a conversation about What's the outcome that we're seeking to achieve here? And are, and has that changed? Because it may be that the first conversation, it's changed for me or for the other person. 
So first, align on the outcome. Second, share my observations. Here's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that you're making choices that I don't see how they connect to the outcome we agreed upon. And I'm concerned. What do you see? What do you notice? Go ahead if you want to. I I can say my comment. Yeah, because I think it's important to really, sometimes I'm missing something in this perspective. And then it's to say, well, if, if we truly see the same thing and you're making a choice, to do something that isn't aligned, um, maybe I'm not the right coach for you for what you're trying to do. Maybe this isn't a good fit. And if it does cross the boundary that I care about, because this is something that I believe is going to cause more damage than good, then I'll say, I'm really concerned. This will cause more damage than good. And I'm not willing to go any farther in this conversation. I need to stop here. Now, if I think a client's going to really hurt somebody, then I also have an obligation to, to, if that's injure themselves or someone else, I need to contact the authorities and make sure there's safety provided. Yeah, hopefully that, that's never never the case. But, yeah. but um, the... So, and I, and, um, I don't want to make any assumptions. This is what you teach your clients to do also, right? This process. Yeah. I've, I've learned from a number of different teachers, but it's, it's, do we have alignment on the outcome? So I'll give a simple analogy. If you and I agreed we were going to build a house. Okay. Great. What's your vision of the house? And what's my vision of the house? Cause I find it's very easy to have very different pictures. So if we don't get specific about what success looks like and how we're going to go about doing that and what milestones we might need to have along the way and how we're going to check in and support each other along the way, then we could easily get off track. So part of defining outcomes is getting enough clarity that we know what success looks like and we know how we're going to partner together and going to achieve it. Yeah, and I, I love what you're saying, and I, I really hope the audience hears what what you said previously on how you approach the problem where the person was violating standards or not really driving towards the outcome that had been agreed. Um, the new improved Tom Hardison is asking questions and really kind of working walking through a process. And then trying to bring the person to come back into alignment. And if that doesn't happen, then there has to be, well, this doesn't line up and um, we need to part company. As a coach, it's it's us leaving. And I think I've only had to do that three times with clients over the past uh, 16 years. But, um, you know, it's so important because if those boundaries aren't enforced, then, you know, I think one person said you get what you tolerate as a leader. So, and I don't know who said it, but I love what you're saying, Tom. I think that you've got so much wisdom in in what you're doing. Where where do people learn more about the generative leadership and the other things that you're doing? Sure. Uh, A couple of places. One is my website, which is generativeleadershipgroup.com. The second, uh, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Tom Hardison on LinkedIn, and uh, those would be the best ways. You could also email me at tom at generativeleadershipgroup.com. I think it's great. I, I think there's a lot to learn, and I, I love the topics that you've got. When, if they go to your website, do you have any like blog posts or free things they can download or something like that to teach more of your model? Sure. Um I, I post, uh, you can find articles. I've got a couple articles on Medium. I've got posts on LinkedIn. I've got blog posts on my website. I've got a white paper on the homepage of my website that talks about the generative leadership and, and building great teams. And there's also a video, uh, Alchemy of Teams, Eight Steps to Build and Sustain Great Teams. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I think this has been a lot of great teaching for our audience. 
Thank you, David. I really enjoyed the conversation with you. Thanks for tuning in today. If you liked the episode with Tom, I mean, I I enjoyed the conversation. You probably could tell. I I just thought he was right on target. Great stuff. Please leave us a comment or a rating. Love to hear from you. Love to get the feedback. If you want to improve your soft skills, please consider habitly.com. Great soft skills training on there. A lot of flexibility and different topics to consider that can help you be your best. And I want to thank you again for joining us. It's really taking the time to learn from skilled people like Tom that can help us be our best. We've got more great guests coming. Hope you come back. Bye for now.